Good morning, everyone. Morning. 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 So great to see so many of you here so early on day three of Google I.O. Last night, I wasn't sure if I was going to make it this early. Uh, my name is Ankit Jain, and I lead all things search and discovery for Google Play. And um, I'm extremely excited to be here and share this material with you today. Um, as most of you know, we've never discussed our search or discovery engines publicly uh, before today. But before I get started, I, I wanted to get to know you guys a little better. So with a raise of hands, how many of you um, are making money on Google Play today? OK, great. Um, how many of you would like to make even more money on Google Play? Great. For those on YouTube, pretty much everyone would like to make even more money. Um, let's step out of our normal roles as developers or business owners, and, and for a second, let's step into the shoes of our users. And, and think like a user when you come to the store. How many of you have installed an app just while browsing? You were bored, you opened the Play Store, uh, saw something interesting, clicked through and installed it. Okay. How many of you have installed an app because uh, you thought about, I, I need to get something done. I need a recipe app, or I need uh, uh, to find a train schedule. Went, looked for it, and then installed it. Okay, that's a smaller, uh, smaller portion. And how many of you have installed an app because a friend of yours told you, hey, you really have to go check out this app, and then you go to the store, look for it, and install it? Great. So, so, my, so my goal today is to talk to you about how we try to bring these online and offline thought processes of how all of us install apps and how we try to get that discovered on play. So I'm going to present you with three high-level sets of information. The first one is our vision for the new Google Play Store. The second is some of the, the details of the search and discovery algorithms that we have and how, and how you can take advantage of them uh, to get discovered more. And finally, I want to leave you with five very concrete examples of what you can do to get discovered more on play. Sounds good? All right, great. So let's get right into it. A few weeks ago, we rolled out the new version of the Google Play Store. It's very different than what we had in the past. About a year ago, a group of us stepped aside and said, if we could reimagine the entire store, the new Google Play experience, what would it be like? The goal was to come up with something that was dynamic, very fresh. The user should be trained and look forward to coming back into the store. Something that is personalized, yet personal. So some of you might be thinking, Ankit, what are you saying? Personalized yet personal. What, what, what's the difference there? Well, personalized to me is something that is personally relevant, related to what you've told us in the past, what you've, users have purchased, what uh, personally relevant because it's popular in the user's area, personally relevant because the user has shown interest in certain categories or in certain developers, or personally relevant because your friends are showing interest in those things. And then we want to take it to the next level. We want to make it personal by showing you and annotating each of these recommendations or each of the pieces of content in our store with why you should get it. This could be a plus one by a friend. This could be a review by a friend. Or this could be something based on the new Google Play game services that Shabi and three others are currently playing Puzzles and Dragons. We should really tell the user, this is why you should get it. And our goal was to help each and every one of you, each and every one of our developers, to get more engaged installs. Because at the end of the day, that's what's really going to move the needle. Those are the users that build uh, sustainable and great businesses. So our goal was threefold. First, to, um, to help our users find what they're looking for as effortlessly and seamlessly as possible. Second, to help Android ship more and more beautiful dev uh, apps. And finally, to help all of you build even more um, thriving uh, businesses on top of our platform. So let's get to meet the meat of today's uh, talk. Let's talk about our major install sources. At the end of the day, nothing can be built unless you've got installs. And specifically, I'm going to talk about how to get engaged installs. So most of you have reached out, or many of you reached out to me in the past and said, hey, I'm, I'm ranked number five or number 10 or number 50 on these top lists or on these trending lists. Th these are what I call our browse and discovery features. And I like to break them into three subcomponents. The first are these top charts, the top list, the editor's picks, the trending lists. Uh, the next are the features that we launched at Google I.O. last year. Uh, these were the personalized recommendations. Some of you saw these uh, as part of a Google Play homepage experience in the, in the cluster there. Others might have seen this on the widgets on the Nexus 7 and the Nexus uh, 10 on the home screens there. And the last set of features that we have for discovery uh, based on your context 
are the related and cross-sell uh, items. These are the users who viewed X also viewed Y on the details page of all of your apps. The, also, the other set, which is users who installed this app, also installed these other apps, which is also on your details pages. And we'll get into details about each of these and how we look at them and how the, the algorithms are built. Um, what most developers don't think to think about as much is the search component. And for the average app, search actually makes up the vast majority of installs. And when I think about search, I like to break it down and look at our query stream from, uh, in, in terms of two kinds of queries. The first are the kinds of queries that many of you raised your hand for, which are, I had to get something done, so I looked it up. I needed to look up a recipe. I wanted to uh, find restaurant reviews in a city that I'm in. I want to find multiplayer games or free games or RPG games, the, the kind of categorical queries. You know the general idea of what you want or what you want to do, and then you use search to find the right app for that, uh, for, to, to fulfill that. The second kind of query is where you know exactly what you're looking for. This is when a friend has told you about an app, or if you've heard about it through marketing, navigational queries. Hey, I, I want to get Hotel Tonight. I want to get Butylish, or I want to get Angry Birds, which is not necessarily a single app, it could be a set of apps, but you know which direction you want to look in. So that's navigational queries. Uh, and, and just to show you how important search is, in any given day, 12% of our active users come back to the store and search at least once for apps. In any given week, half of our users come to our store and search for apps. And even uh, g given the number of apps we have in any given month, there's over six million unique phrases that are being searched for. So really thinking about search uh, is important as you try to figure out how to get discovered on Play. So, so just to put what we've talked about, I've talked about our vision for Google Play and how our goal is to present each user with a personalized play made personal, uh, how search and browse are the two main sources of installs in the store, and finally, a lot of this happens because our goal is to bring the rest of Google to play. That was the transition from Android Market into Google Play. It was to integrate all of our systems together and make Google Play a very smart store, make it your store. So now that we've talked about it, uh, let's step back and think about how we think of our search and discovery systems. When we, when we built our search engines and our discovery engines, we have two options. Either we can spend a lot of time trying to detect the apps that are bad or spammy or simply annoying, or we can spend a lot of time trying to figure out which apps are good. And we spend a lot more time focusing on what's good. Because if we can promote the apps that are not just good from what we can tell, based on your APK, based on your metadata, based on what users are telling us about each of the apps, then other, the other users are also going to find these delightful experiences. And so this part of the talk is going to be talking about how you can complement your app with good app metadata. So the most important piece of your app metadata is your title. It's important to be creative, but it's just as important, if not more important, to be very clear. So this, um, so this example up on screen is um, about an app named Butylish. As you can see, most of you might not have heard of it, some of you might have heard of it, but right after you see the title, you know this app is about makeup and beauty tips. So what this title helps you do is it helps the developer reinforce not just their branding, but also what their app is about. So as you see this more and more often, either in the store or even once you have it installed in your list of apps on your home screen, it's very clear that Butylish is the app I go to for makeup and beauty tips. So I highly recommend uh, t thinking about the name of your app. It also helps a lot for SEO. When someone looks, um, up beauty tips or makeup tips, these guys are at the top of that list just because everyone associates uh, the two of those terms together. The next uh, important part of your details page in your, in your metadata is, uh, is your description. You can write as long a description as you want, but I always say get the main message out first. Um, Star Trek does a great job here. Their first sentence says you can now have a virtual planetarium in your pocket. Again, if you've never used this app, you already know what it's about. After that, you can go on, describe it in more detail, list the awards you have, um, and just have your sales and marketing pitches for your users. But right up front, make sure your user knows what your app is about. And on, on a smaller phone, that's the part that's above the fold. So you want to make sure on that first screen itself, it's extremely clear 
what, what your goal is, what utility you provide, or what entertainment value, or whatever the goal of your app is, what it provides. Now, that also, again, helps a lot with getting found. This app is extremely optimized for star charts, star maps, virtual planetariums. So, so the beginning of descriptions are extremely important, both from a user's perspective and also from our uh, search engine's perspective. The next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about how you can use your app details page to mimic the real user experience. It's important that you set the expectations of your user to be very realistic, to really be what your app is going to be like. The first place to do this is in your screenshots. In our developer console, we let you uh, upload screenshots for tablets, for phones, and really show the user what it's going to be like once you install the app. Now, if you don't do this, um, and your app experience is actually very different from your screenshots, it can have a very negative effect on all of your systems. Why? Because, well, th the user loves what they see on your details page, they install your app, they open the app, and then they see something very different. What, what are they going to do? Well, most users will uninstall the app. Some of those users will go back to the store and give you a low rating, maybe even write you a negative review. And that negative feedback cycle is going to hurt you more than help you. And so, so really thinking about how do you present the user with the right, setting the right expectation and then delivering on it, that's the message here. We're looking for apps that do deliver on their promises. Video previews are the next level of screenshots. With, with a short video, you're able to show the user really what it's like to play with your app. And, and developers have uh, told us that uploading a video can really help gain user adoption. And users in a lot of studies have told us that video previews are amongst the most convincing features of a app details page. Again, the whole goal here is to tell your user what your app does. If you can convince them and make sure that, and communicate what your app's promise is and then deliver on it, you're going to delight them and they're going to recommend you to other users as well. So I talked about reviews and ratings in terms of the feedback loop. And this is a, a key part of, uh, of our search and discovery experience. Now, the first piece of this comes because people come back and review your app, whether it's good or bad. The second piece is we really try to order our reviews and ratings in, the, in an order that is relevant to the user. So you're going to see reviews that are on the same device as the current user, in the same country as the current user. And as time goes on, people that are in a user circle or people that the users trust are going to come at the top of these reviews. So investing in making sure that your users are reviewing and rating your apps will be key going forward, because that's a very strong signal for us at Google Play. So I'm, I'm going to step back and tell you a story about a developer. A developer in India that I was talking to a few weeks ago, um, and his goal was to target uh, the rural population. As you can see on the graph on the right, about 75% of the, in India's population lives in rural cities. So his goal was to target the audience that had low to mid-end phones and was on slow to 2G networks. So he had really optimized his app to give a delightful experience for these users. But then he reached out to me and said, Ankit, you know, when I look at my reviews, I have this polarized view. There's a whole bunch of five stars with people saying, I could never have imagined technology would change my world this way. And also a lot of one stars with people saying, complete crap, I can't believe uh, I downloaded this, uninstalling it right now, right? And, and he was perplexed. He wasn't sure what was going on. And we, and we dug a little deeper, and one of the things we noticed was that he was getting a lot of pos a positive reaction from the people in rural areas, his target audience. And he was getting a lot of negative reviews from the people on the 4G networks, on the top-of-the-line devices, uh, because his app just was not designed for them. His goal was not to go after that market. And so the thing that he ended up doing was he went to the developer console and um, targeted his app to the countries and carriers where his target audience really was. And since then, he's already seen an uptick in his average rating and his reviews, and, and hopefully that continues over time. But my message here to you is think about who you're trying to target. You know, for most apps, you don't have to worry about this. You can let your app get to everybody. But if your app is targeted at a, at a specific set of target audience, make sure those are the people helping you get even more adoption. You don't want people not in your target audience polluting your, your reviewer rating. So, so we've talked about creating a very creative yet clear message to your title and description. 
to mimic your real world experience through your images, your screenshots, and your video previews. And finally, really about understanding your audience. This is what's going to help you uh, optimize your, your app details page. So um, let's see how this manifests itself. At the end of the day, there's the top charts and the search engines. What are the things that we look for? How, once you do all of these great things on your app details page, how does it feed back? And no search or discovery system would be complete without really taking into account the statistics that we're constantly collecting. So the, so the first piece of this, as most of you probably have already figured out, are the installs. Of course we care about how many installs each app has. The more you have, the higher up in the, in the rankings you'll go. We also care about how many uninstalls you have, because that's a metric for us to know whether users are having a good or a bad experience. Now, some of you are game developers out there, and you might say, hey, my game overall takes one gig of memory or two gigs of memory on, on a person's device. So after they're done playing my game, of course they're going to uninstall my app, because they want to play the next game. Uh, you know, they've already won every level there is. Why are you going to hurt me? And that's why we have the third statistic, which is long installs. If a person plays through or uses an app for a, for a long period of time, we don't want to penalize it. Our goal is really to detect the behavior, which is, hey, I installed an app. I really did not have a good experience, so I'm uninstalling it right away. So, so the long install encapsulate that phenomenon in it. Um, in the coming months, I, one of the things that we want to focus on is engagement and really understanding for each of your apps when are people using it, how are they using it, and how is it different across different kinds of apps. For example, Google Now, I just go to it when I need to pick up my latest boarding pass. I'm not going to spend tens, if not um, tens of minutes or hours on it, but there might be a game where I spend uh, an hour or two on it. But that doesn't mean one is better than the other. They're just different kinds of functions that they're providing. And, and this is an area where having a conversation with all of you is great, and I, and, and I really look forward to having some of your feedback. So a lot of this is about setting the stage for the first conversation. We've never discussed any of this before. So if you guys have ideas, please, uh, please let us know. Uh, I'll talk about Google Play, the game services that we launched, and how we're going to use that for engagement uh, in the coming months as well. Here's a query that I get very often from, uh, from developers. Hey, for, for some search query, I'm number three. Even though the app ranked above mine has fewer installs and has a lower rating than me. Right? I, I'm sure many of you have thought about this as well. Um, now, on the previous slide, I talked about the uninstall rate. Not only do we look at the number of people that are uninstalling your app compared to the number of people installing it, we also have some amount of a recent, uh, recent uninstall rate as well. The idea here is that you might have an app that has not been updated in a couple of years, and now more people are uninstalling your app than installing it. Or there's a, a newer app, or your app could be on the other side of this, where you made an update, and now a lot of people are really keeping your app. That's going to help you go move up in the rankings. We want to make sure our users are getting the best apps um, as easily as possible. So I hope, I hope this answers this very common question that I get. Um, So um, the, the, the other uh, piece of what we've talked about a lot at Google I.O. this year is personalization across all of our products at Google. And Google Play is no exception to this. We're constantly slicing and dicing all the data that we're collecting in order to personalize and improve each user's experience. One, I'll give you a couple of examples. The query Yahoo in the US leads to people installing the Yahoo app or the Yahoo Mail app. In Japan, however, people are installing the Yahoo Japan app. And over time, our systems learn this and figure out, hey, in Japan, show Yahoo Japan as number one. In the US, show Yahoo and Yahoo Mail as number one and two. Similarly, on tablets, people tend to install different apps than they do on mobile devices. So again, using the feedback loops of what people are searching for, what they're clicking on, and what they're enjoying and installing, we're able to really tailor the search experience and the search results uh, per device type, per locale, and across a whole bunch of different dimensions. About a year ago, uh, in addition to having the search suggestions as you type, we added the ability to have navigational search suggestions. These are suggestions that Google believes are the right one for a user. So as this user is typing in SUB, most users tend to actually go straight to subway surfers. So we allow the user to do that right from the search suggest box. If you click on that navigational suggestion, you won't go to a search results page. You'll go straight to the app's details page. It even shows you the icon of the app that it's going to take you straight to. 
Now, if a user wants to find the tips or the strategies or other apps that are around Subway Surfers, they can still complete their query and look at the app details page. Again, the theme here is that we're trying to make it easier for users to get what they want. Let's, um, let's switch gears a little bit, and, and I'll let you guys look at this for, for a couple of seconds. There's a lot of data up there. So, so a lot of you um, always have asked us the question, how are your top lists generated, when are they generated, and what's, what's the rationale behind them? Now, now, like any search or discovery system, we're constantly tuning our systems. And this is a snapshot of what it looks like um, recently. There's, um, there's a basic quality uh, barrier that's there. There are some review and rating metrics that we take into account. But at a high level, we create top lists daily per country, per category, and even per device type. You guys saw some of the design for tablet uh, top lists that were launched earlier at I.O. And our top paid, free, and grossing lists are really targeting first-time users to Google Play or people that just got a new device because they're looking for the basic apps that, need, that they need to load up in order to get their stuff done. What's most popular on Google Play? The top new paid and the top new lists are targeting users who have the basic apps and saying, hey, what's, what's new right now? What's new and popular? Um, and, and for that reason, we, we limit it to the apps that have been published in the last 30 days. And, and this is very important because many app developers launch an app in a single country and then over time roll it out to a bunch of countries. So um, I get a question a lot of times saying, hey, I just launched in Italy last week and it's going gangbusters. We're, you know, at the, we're just getting more installs than we ever have. How come we're not in the top new free or top new paid list? Well, the reason is your original launch might have been six months ago, and so you're not qualified to be um, in the top new list of even new countries that you launch in. It's a global published date that we look at. So, so think about your global rollout strategy. If being in the top new list is part of your strategy, that 30-day window is extremely important. Um, and the metrics across these are different. For the grossing, we look at the, the revenues. For the others, we look at installs over, over the last several days. The next list that I want to talk about is our trending list, and this is one that um, has had no clarity about it ever. Um, internally, we like to call this our movers and shakers list. Our goal here is to present the user with a system that can give them what's really hot right now. Amongst all the apps on Google Play, what are the apps that m a lot of users, more than we predict, are, uh, are, are being installed? So for every app, we have a predicted growth rate. This predicted growth rate takes into consideration where in your app lifecycle you are and how many installs you have. And then if, if, an, if a given app performs significantly better, if it starts getting installs much faster than what we predict, it makes it into this movers and shakers or trending list. So when the Soccer World Cup was going on a couple of years ago, the FIFA app was at the top of this list. Last year, when the unfortunate tsunami hit Japan, many radiation tracking list, uh, apps were at the top of this list. And any app can, uh, can be part of this list. And we're looking at a 30-day window to figure out really what's hot right now. I mentioned the related and cross-sell features that we have. These are the, on every app's details page, there are the people who viewed this also viewed these other apps. And the users who installed this app also installed these other apps. So let's go through a few examples. The first one's Bank of America, a user looking to do banking. When they're considering a banking app, they might consider other banking apps. PayPal or Wells Fargo, but once they've decided to get the Bank of America app, they're more likely to install a complementary app, not a supplementary app. So here, you see them installing a trading app, such as Merrill Edge, or another app by the same developer, the Bofa Help app. In the middle is an example of a user looking to get a Bible. Users looking to get a Bible might consider the various options, but once they get the Bible, they'll get other religious apps, not other Bible apps. So it's complementary to what they've already gotten. The third example is a widget that helps users show the time on their home screen. They might consider digit clock or dash clock, but once they install the dash clock widget, they've bought into that style, that ecosystem. So then they're more likely to install other widgets or other add-ons that have the same style to have the unified experience on their Android device. Last year at Google I.O., we launched personalized recommendations. 
these, these, as I said, these were on the home screen of the, of the Google Play homepage, and they've been performing extremely well. And with the new launch of uh, Google Play, we really decided to double down on this and per start personalizing many different parts of our system. So I thought it's a good opportunity for me to tell you what really we look for. We have over 80 signals, not just from Google Play, but also from the rest of Google. But some of our major signals include apps that are complementary and supplementary to apps that users installed in the past. We look at apps that are popular in a user's area. We look at apps that have been plus one by a user's circles, apps reviewed by a user's circles. We also look at apps that are developed by some of you if the user's already shown interest in your, in your developer account, in, by other apps by you. So uh, here are some recommendations for three different users. You can see plus ones by people's friends. You can see uh, apps that are similar to other things they've bought, also apps that are popular in their area. So how does this manifest itself? So this is the home page uh, that we envision. This is going to start rolling out to different users um, over the coming months. On the, left, uh, on the left is my grandma's home page. That's what she sees. She grew up um, in very close to military quarters in India, because my grandpa lived in that area. And uh, she was very interested in getting stuff done. This is, we call her the kernel of the family. So for her, actually, the task list makes so much sense. But, but growing up in a military area also means that you play a lot of cards. She's, she actually plays two to four hours of card games a day. It's ridiculous. I don't know how she does it. Um, and, and so seeing the tablet highlight apps for her and seeing the card games right up there is really what's relevant to her. For me, I travel a lot. And so on the tablet highlight section, not only do you see Google Translate, which I, which I should get so that I can communicate with people all around the world, but it also tells me why. It tells me that my friend Abhinav has plus one this app. He had a great experience, so that helps me improve trust in the system and get this app. You can take this a step further uh, on all of our category homepages. Both of these are for me. Um, on the left, I live in San Francisco, so you see the San Francisco Giants app, you see the Oakland Baseball app, you see a Sacramento Kings app. Uh, on the right is the news homepage. You see uh, news apps. And, uh, and magazine apps that are related to what I bought in the past. I have Pulse, and people who have Pulse tend to also enjoy New York Times. It's amazing to me that Times of India comes on my personalized homepage, uh, but it wouldn't on some of yours, just because my friends tend to come from that part of the world, and they, they say this is a great app uh, to, to adopt it. How could we apply personalization to search? I've talked about using location. So a user in Japan will see different results for Yahoo than a user in the US. But we think categorical queries are a place where we can really help the user find what they're looking for. Imagine a user who searches for free games. If, if we know that they like word games, showing them wor free word games makes a lot of sense. If they like RPG games, showing them those kind of games uh, is going to help get an, uh, a much faster acquisition rate. For train schedules, a user in New York should get the subway train schedule, a user in San Francisco should get either the BART train schedule or the Caltrain schedule. It just makes sense. And so over the coming months, we're going to roll out more experiments, and finally to everybody, personalization across categorical searches. So I've thrown a lot of things at you so far. So, so just to step back and summarize it, we've talked about the search statistics, the feedback loops that we look at in order to improve our search and our discovery systems. We talked about navigational search suggestions. We talked about how our top charts are generated across each category generated daily and across every country. We talked about what trending apps are, what it means to, to be in there and how you can get in there. We talked about how related and cross-sell works. And we also talked about how we're starting to personalize play and how that's going to roll out over the coming months and how that really uh, fulfills our vision of a personalized play made personal. So, I promised you guys I'd, I'd leave you with five things that you can do to improve your discoverability on play. So let, let's get right into it. But, but before we do that, I want to tell you it's just as important to build a good app. So take the time to go through those app developer guidelines on developer.android.com and make sure you have a good app. You can complement that by optimizing on the store, but at the end of the day, nothing substitutes a very good experience for your app. Two months ago, we added a list of guidelines, the tablet app guidelines, what it means to be designed for tablets. And I highly recommend that you get this design for tablet designation. Earlier at I.O., we announced the design for tablets top lists. 
on some of our home pages. Over time, this is going to roll across the store. So a tablet user really gets the best experience uh, possible by showing the apps and promoting the apps that have gone through the trouble of making that experience better. So you're going to see this not just in the top list, but over time in search in, and in all of our other uh, discovery features as well. The developer console helps you with the optimization tips that they've um, added. And the, and the next talk by Ellie, Miles, and Ricardo will go through this in detail, what you can do to really get some of these designations. So, so get, get the design for tablet designation. Number two, and this is, uh, this is a much less known uh, fact about the way we do ser search ranking at Google Play. Today, most articles that are published on the web about Play apps have a link at the end that said Google Play Store or Play Link. Actually, over 99% of anchors that we get into the Google Play Store just have those two phrases. And that doesn't help us at all. We want to help you get discovered even more on Play. Sure, you tell us a little bit about your app, but if a trusted source on the right, for example, TechCrunch is telling us what your app is about, even before you have any installs, we can trust it and start boosting you for those terms. So next time you're talking to a blog writer or someone writing an, app about, uh, writing an article about your app, have them give you some link juice. Have them put something interesting in those links uh, linking to your app. The third one is to avoid common mistakes. Now, I told you there were 6 million and, and more unique phrases that are searched for every month. What I didn't tell you is over half of them are misspelled. That, that's amazing. And half the people are, are mistyping queries. But that, that's just how the query stream is on mobile today. Uh, so, so as Google, what we have to do is we have to aggressively correct for it. We have to make sure we help the user find what they're looking for, even if it's a typo. So the one thing, one thing you can learn from this is don't name your app something that is a cute and, but a common misspelling of a very popular app. Because chances are, you'll get, a user looking for your app will get auto-corrected into something that you're not happy with. A second thing I already talked about, using the targeting expressions on the developer console carefully, which countries and carriers you're targeting depending on your target audience. And the third one, uh, again, is one that we've, th that is a little subtle, but I think it's important. If you do have a developer URL that is not a play.google.com link or a code.google.com link, something that is yours, your home on the web, if it exists, do make sure you upload that in the developer console. Why? Well, we, we, we crawl the web. We index the web for our web search engine. When we use a lot of, uh, use a lot of those signals in order to help you, if we know that you're, you're the kind of developer that is about a specific subset of the world, we will help you get discovered when people are looking for those terms on Google Play. So again, if you have a developer URL other than something at google.com, do upload that. Number four is to make your APK smaller, right? Users tend to install smaller apps a lot more than they do larger apps, and they tend to uninstall larger apps at a higher rate as well. Let's think about why. Um, as your phone runs out of memory, it, there is a finite amount of memory, users tend to go through the, the list of apps they have in decreasing order of size and start uninstalling the apps that they're using least uh, actively. So the further down that list you are, the less likely you are to be uninstalled. So, so make your APK size smaller. In the coming months, we're going to start looking deeper into the APK from a search and discovery perspective as well. We're going to look at the kind of SDKs you're linking with, the libraries you're linking with, to figure out what is your app really about. Looking at the kind of uh, sites that your app is connecting with by emulating it, and try to really figure out what is your app about so we can help users find apps that, that will help them uh, do what they're looking to do. And the last one, and, and this is something many of you have asked us for, is to create a second channel of distribution the viral channel. There hasn't been too much of a viral channel, and I'm going to go through a few things that we're going to be pushing over the coming months. The first one are highly rated apps. These are apps that your friends, your circles, and others that you trust have rated highly in our store. So here are, are some apps that are rated highly for me. On the right, you see and, and, uh, the Quora app is rated highly by my roommate, David. He rated it five stars. Then Logo Quiz, my friend Ruthika said, it's an extremely fun game. It's so addicting, she couldn't stop. Right? That's the personal touch that we can uh, um, add to the Google Play Store. Some of these apps have never been on the home page. This is the easiest way for each of you to get on Google Play's home page. Have your users review, uh, review your apps. Their friends will start seeing them 
on the Google Play homepage. I've talked a lot about plus ones already. Plus ones have been an integral part of our system since we first launched personalized recommendations last year. The reason I bring it up again is because there's an API, which I'm not sure why many of you are not using. This, is the, this API is available on the Google Plus uh, Recommendations API page, and it enables you to allow your users to plus one an app from within your app. So you don't have to send a mess have a message that says, go to Google Play and plus one my app. You don't need to have your users leave your experience. Keep them in your app. We want to make it easier. So we already have in-app billing for you guys. There's the in-app plus one. And in coming months, we're going to also have in-app rate and review. So again, we don't want your users to leave your app. If we can do what they need to do from within your app, great. And we're going to help you do that as well. And the last thing uh, to create the viral loop is to integrate with Google Play game services. At first, what you're going to get is when someone opens your app, they can see which of their friends are playing it. They can find opponents. It makes your app more interactive. You've got the multiplayer. You have the leaderboards. It makes your app social. In the longer term, though, uh, this, along with the Google Plus Moments API, which allows you to share specific pieces of information, I'm currently playing this game, or I am at level 27 of this game, will allow us in the store to annotate and make things more personal. Right? How great would it be if um, the, my homepage said, Right now, Shelby is looking for an opponent for Riptide. That's the best way to not only get someone to install your app, but open it right away, get you those engaged users that you're looking for. So, so I highly recommend uh, integrating with the Google Play game services. Again, the five things that you should do to get discovered more on Play. Get the design for tablets designation. Start getting helpful web anchors. Avoid some of the common mistakes about misspellings, because we have to autocorrect for them and targeting your, your audience correctly, reduce the size of your APK, and then really start closing that viral loop. Help your users promote you in addition to depending on just the store. So we've talked a lot about user acquisition. I've talked about the organic growth that you can get from the search and discovery aspects of, of the Google Play Store. We've talked about the viral aspect of search and discovery, and many of you already know about the paid aspect, which is uh, important to some of your businesses as well. I won't talk too much about it, but what I will say is that investing in paid uh, user acquisition can, be, uh, can have a very positive impact on organic and viral growth as well. Um, and, and so if you can, it is, it is something to think about um, in, in the bigger picture of things. Now, user acquisition is just the first step um, in creating lifetime value for your users. As a business owner, I always like to think about my key metrics and have a very good handle on them. And the one that I've found in the mobile space and in any user-centric space is the lifetime value of every one of my users. We talked about user acquisition. Let me briefly mention the other two. User retention, I like to break into two different ratios. The first is a short-term user retention ratio. This is how do I initially keep my, my users? Most of the time, this happens because uh, the users like what you're promising them. They, they install your app, they open it. The long-term user retention ratio, which is very much like the long install metric that I talked about, is the ongoing mechanics of your app, or, what, or you, develop, uh, you delivering on your promise. So in the example of Scramble with Friends, initially they got a lot of their users because it was very much like the word games many of us grew up with. But over time, their social their interactive features and what kept it growing and made it successful. User monetization, I look at in terms of two different lenses. The big picture is the revenue per install. And that, and that makes sense. It's a very good macro metric. And, it, and it's comparable to your user acquisition cost, your cost per install as well. So you can do that. But the real picture is the revenue per active user. That's what you have most control over, the people that are in your system, in your game, in your app, and how can you tune it to make the most money? So, so as you think about your users, try to break it down into the key metrics and have a very good handle on them. So I hope that this talk has helped you get a good idea of how we build some of our search and discovery systems. My goal was to really start this conversation. I want to continue it. Um, and none of this would have been possible without my team uh, on, at Google Play. So, so this is you know, my shout out to them. Uh, thank you for doing all the great stuff that you've done. And for, and for all of you, uh, thank you for being here so early. I would like to continue this conversation. I'll be at office hours right after this. Um, so if you have any questions, please come there. Or you can reach out to me on Google Plus or Twitter. Um, and I'm happy to continue this. Uh, thank you very much.